How many of you have ever heard of Harry Truman? Now, I'm not talking about the Harry Truman that became president of the United States and lived in Washington, D.C. I'm talking about the Harry Truman who owned 23 cats and lived in the state of Washington. Harry and his cats lived on the side of a mountain called Mount St. Helens back in the late 1900s. And it was a volcano, obviously, we know that now. And the volcano had laid dormant for over 150 years. Now, but now it was beginning to rumble. It was starting to make some noise. And a number of people told Harry that he needed to move. They thought the volcano, or they knew the volcano was going to blow. But Harry refused, and, and he said, I've lived here all my life. I know this old mountain better than anybody else. I am not going anywhere. On May 18th, 1980, at 8.31 a.m., the mountain blew, and the force of the explosion was 500 times greater than the power of a bomb dropped at Hiroshima. The debris blackened the sky from Seattle to New York and as far south as Oklahoma. And nobody has seen Harry or his 23 cats ever since. Now, here's a question. Was Harry free to remain on the side of that mountain? I mean, could they force him to leave? Apparently not. Harry was free to remain on that mountain as long as he wanted to, but he was not free from the consequences of his decision. Now, this observation brings us to our text this morning, this evening, sorry. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Or, as another version puts it, Christ has uh, liberated us into freedom. We are a free people. As Christians, we've been freed from the uh, condemnation of sin. We have been liberated from the Old Testament law and its list of do's and don'ts uh, to be acceptable to God. We're not under the law anymore. But false teachers had begun to convince Christians in Galatia that they needed to go back to those rules and those regulations, that they needed to be brought back under the yoke of slavery to the law. Now, today, a lot of people don't understand the Old Testament law. Right? They think, oh, it's just a bunch of do's and don'ts that don't really apply to us today. And, and honestly, some people could, probably couldn't even recite the Ten Commandments in today's world. But does that mean that they're no longer in slavery to those rules and regulations? Well, no. You see, they may not know much about the Old Testament and its laws, but they still sense when they've messed things up in their lives. It's like the law is written on their hearts and they feel that they need to do something to pay for those sins. I like to call it karma. You see, everybody believes in this idea of karma. They recognize that the scales of their lives are out of balance and they've done so many bad things in their lives that they uh, need to do, they need to balance those things out, those failures, by doing an equivalent number of good things. I saw a picture recently that said, can you do enough good to deserve to go to heaven? The problem with that is that most people really don't think that they can. They know that they've done bad things and they're not quite sure that no matter what they do, that they can do enough to balance out those scales. And the reason that most people don't think they can do enough is because, well, the Bible says they can't. Right? You can't do enough good to satisfy your conscience, and you can't do enough good to satisfy God's righteousness. So you're always going to be dissatisfied because you simply cannot do enough. Your only hope is to accept God's grace. Ephesians 2 and verses 8 and 9 says, You have been saved through faith, and this is not your undoing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. You see, it's by grace, by the grace of God, that we can be free from our sin. And by that grace, we can be free from the uh, the constant tyrannies of do's and don'ts, the lists that would run and ruin our lives. One of the key teachings of Scripture is that we've been saved to become a free people. You know, Jesus said in John 8:36, "If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed." 
And 2 Corinthians 3, 17 says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And then Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2 and verse 16 that we should live as free men. But that does raise a question. If you've been set free from the rules and regulations and lists of do's and don'ts, are you free to live however you want to? I mean, if there's no list, how can someone say you're wrong to do what you want to do? Well, there are actually people who've said things like that. In fact, back in 2004, there was a famous televangelist named Robert Schuller, And he was especially famous because he preached in Crystal Palace. And because he was so famous and influential, um, he was asked to address a group called the National Evangelical Association. And here's what he said. There are some things in the Bible I cannot swallow, but you get saved not by the book, but by the blood. Keep your message positive. Understand God is a God of grace and glory, so forget the matter of justice. Repentance is not a healthy response. Jesus never called a person a sinner. Rather, He reserved His righteous rebuke for those who use their authority to generate guilt and cause people to lose their ability to taste and enjoy their right to dignity. Yep, I'm pretty sure He was wrong. Schuller said you don't have to repent and and that Jesus never called a person a sinner and, and all those things. But Jesus and the early church did say stuff like that. They said, go and sin no more in John 5, 14 and 8, 11. And Jesus preached, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand in Matthew 4, 17. And then later when Peter preached his first sermon uh, of the church, he said in Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then later in Acts 3, 19, it says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. What Schuller and others have preached is something called cheap grace. Now, cheap grace is a message that says you can be saved and you can still do all the things that you want to do. And that's heresy. It's it's a false teaching. But this kind of theology has been around for years. In 1943, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, a German preacher who publicly opposed Hitler, was asked how it was possible for the church of that day to sit back and let Hitler seize absolute power. And and here's his answer. It was the teaching of cheap grace. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ. So basically, cheap grace is using God's mercy as a free ticket to live as however you want to live. But Paul rejected cheap grace. Back to Galatians 5 where we are studying tonight. In verse 13 we read, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And then he explained that there's a price to be paid if you embrace this cheap grace. Look at Galatians 5, 19-21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and these the like. And then notice what verse 21 says. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Or the kingdom of God. So in other words, if you embrace this cheap grace, if you use your freedom as a Christian, as an opportunity to live according to the flesh so that you can do whatever you want to do, your ticket is not for heaven. Your ticket is for hell. Now, whoa, hold on, wait, wait a minute. Paul, you, you just got done telling us that God has freed us from a list of do's and don'ts. But now you're telling us that there's another list. Like, what are you talking about? And if we don't follow that list, we're going to end up in hell? Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. If you live contrary to the will of God, it's kind of like Harry Truman insisting that he could live on the side of that mountain. You're free to do that. You are free to live that way. But there are consequences. 
You see, here's the deal. We all know what the list is. Galatians 5 and verse 19 says, The works of the flesh are evident. So in other words, it's obvious. You know these things are wrong. Nobody has to spell it out for you. And instinctively, we know Christians shouldn't do stuff like that. But when we or others do this stuff, we do it because we want to. I once heard a preacher say, everyone does what they want to do. And so if you want to please Jesus, I'll do what, if I want to please Jesus, I'll do what pleases Him. Because that is what I want to do. But if I want to please me, that's what I'm going to do. It all boils down to this. If my faith is all about me, is my faith all about me, or is it all about Jesus? But let's get back to this list thing again. I make lists all the time, to-do lists. Um, they're, they're the list of things that I need to do in a day or in a week, things I've got to get done. But I found that lists can create pressure, and if I don't get the things done, I get antsy, I get frustrated, I can even get angry at myself. And that's just, what, that's, that's just about lists that I make for myself. What about lists that others or God makes for me? If I feel overwhelmed by to-dos and to-don'ts on the list that I make, what am I likely to do about the list that other people make for me? Have you ever noticed how a little kid responds when they're told to pick up their toys, when they're ordered? What's that child often do? Jet does it all the time. They moan and they groan and they whine and they complain. They say, I can't do that. Jet's big thing is, it, it doesn't fit. It doesn't work. And for the most part, the toys, they, they don't get picked up. So how do you get a child to pick up their toys? Well, one way is to threaten, right? And that's what the law is all about. And that works, but it's a constant battle and no one is happy with the outcome. But another way to help them uh, is to help them pick up the toys. And that's what grace is all about. When you help them pick up the toys, you don't want to do it all for the kid. But you're not asking them to do it all by themselves. So they're not as frustrated about it. You can even make a game out of it. Who can pick these up the fastest? Look at Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, this is the famous fruit of the Spirit passage, but where does that fruit come from? I'll give you a hint. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. Acts 2.38 tells us that when we repent and we're baptized, the, the, name of the, Holy, the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, you receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. So, in other words, once you become a Christian, the Spirit gets inside of you to help you pick up the toys to help you do the right things in your life. Now, He's not going to do it all for you, but you don't have to do it all by yourself. Somebody once called this transformative grace. The Spirit's presence is inside of you to help transform you so that you grow to the point where you instinctively do what God wants you to do. It's not cheap grace. It's transformative grace. God's grace gets inside you to transform you. Somebody once put it this way, grace is not a license to sin. Grace is the power of God to overcome it. The point is this. The law won't change you, but God's grace will. Rules and regulations or lists, they can only do so much. But in the end, if the lists are all you have, you'll end up frustrated and overwhelmed. You need the grace of God what you need to do is humble yourself before God, seek His forgiveness, and seek His grace. Kathleen Wheeler wrote a poem <coughs> excuse me, that explains how this works for the Christian. He came to my desk with quivering lip. The lesson was done. Have you a new leaf for me, dear teacher? I have spoiled this one. I took this leaf all sold and blotted and, now, and gave him a new one all unspotted then into his tired heart I smiled, Do better now, my child. I went to the throne with trembling heart. The day was done. Have you a new day for me, dear master? I have spoiled this one. 
He took my day, all so spo soiled and blotted, and gave me a new one, all unspotted. Then into my tired heart he smiled, do better now, my child. I don't know what your need might be tonight. Maybe you're not a Christian and you want to have the Spirit in you to guide you, to help you in this walk of life, this, this, this path that we call life. Maybe you want to put on Christ in baptism tonight. And if that's the case, please call one of us. Let us know. We'll meet you at the building. We'll, 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 we'll study. We'll, we'll baptize. We'll answer any questions we can. We'll baptize you in the waters of baptism. And you'll come up a new and living creature. Tonight, if you are a Christian and you have let the world pull you back, pull you away from doing the right things, and you want to get on the right path, and you want to make your faith all about Jesus, and following Him and doing His will and what God wants for your life, you need prayers for strength and encouragement, contact us. We want to pray with you. We want to love on you. We want to encourage you. If you have any need tonight, please let us know. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Let's close in prayer together. Father God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. We thank you for this time that we have to, to gather together online to watch uh, and hear a message from your word. God, we, we pray that, that we can take the things that we've talked about tonight and we can apply them to our lives, that we can bring souls to come to know you. God, we love you and we thank you most of all for Jesus and for his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. It's in his name that we do pray. Amen.